All right, so let's get started. Just quick sort of, I've had a couple people come to the office hours ask, I've heard there have been some conversations here about the difference between Nash and Pareto. So just as a quick you know, review, just as a conceptual model, you and your roommate uh, both could clean the apartment. Uh, but uh, you know, th then we kind of think of this in terms of the difference between Nash and Pareto. Um, ultimately, uh, no one wants to clean the apartment and realizes that if one person doesn't clean the apartment, the other one would be a sucker for trying to clean the apartment. That's a Nash equilibrium. A Pareto equilibrium is the fact that if both of you decide to clean the apartment, you'll both be out of better off, but you both have to decide to do it. And so you can make a Pareto improvement, your, both of your outcomes can be better if you both coordinated and decide to clean the apartment. So that is a Pareto improvement. If you cannot make any more Pareto improvements from your current position, then it's a Pareto equilibrium. So those are sort of the, the differences there. Um, it's a Nash equilibrium if by yourself, you cannot do any better for yourself. And so, and in fact, uh, in a social setting, if you did something else, you probably would be helping someone else out at a cost to yourself. So the Nash is, I'm just gonna do what's selfish for me because I cannot count on anyone else doing it. Then the Pareto improvement <coughs> is if we both coordinate, then we both can do better for both of ourselves. And so because we're making improvements for both of us, that happen to require us to coordinate, but the fact that we're both uh, benefiting from it makes it a Pareto improvement. And then a Pareto equilibria is a point from which there are no Pareto improvements. So then it's a Pareto optimum. So just something, yeah. So I'm not thinking of a Nash equilibrium. Uh, Nash, they uh, equilibrium is on me, I only clean my own room. Uh, Nash, well, y you would only do, <coughs> if, if you, uh, if you, were the only one who would possibly clean your own room and nobody else could come in, then maybe, but it'd be even better if you just didn't do any work whatsoever. So it's you do as little possible, um, given that no one else, you can't count, if you can't count on anyone else changing their position, what's the best thing you can do? And so that might mean you have to clean your own room. But if someone else happens to notice your room's dirty and they come by and they clean it, uh, and then maybe the Nash equilibrium is you don't do anything at all. But yeah, you have to think about what you can count on from everyone else and assume they're also thinking about what they can count on from everyone else. And the Nash equilibrium is what everybody usually does that is sort of, uh, if you only can control yourself and not coordinate with them, what's mm -hmm. the position that's the best to be in? Yeah. Is it necessary <coughs> that you have coordination in setting your equilibrium? No, but it, it, it's not strictly necessary. All that's necessary is that everybody has to move to a position you have to find, there has to exist another position in decision space that makes everyone's outcomes better. Most of the time that requires coordination. So there are games that we could engineer where Nash and Pareto overlap. But uh, in most coordination games or most of uh, these uh, collective action problems, then, then that's kind of the issue is that uh, the, the selfish game is the one where it's the Nash and it's very far away from the Pareto and you almost need to add an additional incentive structure to cause people to move up toward the Pareto frontier. So everybody could be doing better, but you, only if they act a certain way. And so we maybe need to, <coughs> we need to add taxes or quotas or other sorts of things to force coordination between people. Uh, so there are related things like a coordinated equilibrium. Like the whole reason that we stop at stoplights is because it's a so-called coordinated equilibrium in game theory. And that's because you have an additional signal that comes in, and it is really, really costly for me to run a red light because I'm probably gonna get hit. So it is a Nash, given the signal, the Nash equilibrium actually is for me to cooperate with the stoplight because it's bad for me not to. So that's a so-called coordinated equilibrium. So there are these mechanisms we can design that bring the Nash up to different places we want them to be. And if you're interested in that, I recommend looking up the larger work of uh, Stackelberg games. And these are first mover games where you have a party that acts first and they change the game for all the other parties and then all the other parties play the Nash. So very often, like um, you can think of, of uh, you know, things like BitTorrents and things like that, you can frame in these contexts where you can say like, given that I know that every agent that is sharing on this network is going to do what selfishly, you know, right? How can I kind of engineer the network so they're forced to do something, like they're forced to share, so.
but that's kind of, now we're getting kind of outside of the, the, the realm of the class, but I wanted to at least try to make it clear that Nash and Pareto are very often distinct things, and that, um, that clean the apartment <coughs> example, I think, is a common example to kind of show the difference, or any kind of collective action problem. So whether you drive on the highway uh, might be another thing. It's Nash optimal for me to take the highway, but it's Pareto optimal for some people to take the bus and some people to take the highway. So it's actually better for everybody if only a small fraction of people take the highway, but locally, everybody's going to want to take the highway. So Nash versus Pareto. So any questions about those distinctions, Nash versus Pareto? Just an example of how things get really exciting when you go to multiple objectives. And, and it comes down to a mathematical property of it's difficult to sort things on a plane. You know, on a line, it's easy to sort things. But once you put them on a plane, there's all sorts of ways you can say one thing is better than another thing. And so you kind of got to look at it from different angles. And that's what Pareto's looking at it from one angle, and Nash is looking at it from another angle. Okay. All right, so the angle that we are looking at things right now is, um, is thinking about these things that are not inspired by biology, but are inspired by nature. And so we have been moving toward simulated annealing, which, uh, which may be the ultimate conclusion of this lecture. If not this lecture, then definitely um, the next one. Um, but we're basically um, just trying to sort of understand how can we think about problems uh, in, that are of interest to engineers that are inspired by natural physical processes. Now it's sort of physics inspired. And so I, I kind of gave a very high level overview of this, and I'm going to get a little more uh, concrete. So hopefully that'll be kind of uh, helpful here. And so this, you can think of these either physics inspired algorithms or stat mech inspired algorithms. Um, and so, you know, we talked about how, uh, you know, physicists for, you know, a long time, for at least, you know, 100, 200 years, have been interested in this idea that if I have a box, of molecules and another box of molecules, one where all the molecules are in a corner and the other where they're filled throughout the box, somehow you can make a guess as to the timing of events here. Uh, because uh, you can kind of say that if these things were in a timeline, it is more likely that they started over here and ended over here. So there is some sort of arrow of time that goes from that direction to the other direction. And so from a physics point of view, you want to say, well, locally, the way particles you know, bump into each other, there's no, there's, it's, it's totally time symmetric. Uh, it, if, you, if you zoom in on a single molecule and play that video forward or backward, it looks identical. And yet, when we zoom out and we look at the, the group of them together, then it's pretty clear which direction's going which. This way, the egg is, uh, is, is totally full, and then here it's cracked and broken on the floor. It's, it's very unlikely that the cracked egg that's broken on the floor goes back and becomes a full egg again. And so we kind of you know, can see that this arrow is there. And so the physicists were saying, well, how, what's special about this distribution over this distribution. And that led to the development of this framework of entropy, which uh, you can define uh, roughly, you can kind of define them in continuous ways and discrete ways. If there's a continuous way, uh, if the number of ways in which you can reconfigure a system comes from a continuum, you define it with an integral. If it's a discrete set of configurations, can define it with a sum, but uh, but basically it's um, if if this is some distribution, I'll call this you know f start is some distribution of positions, which I can maybe have a vector there, and this is f finish, and this is some distribution here. And I'm interested in these distributions and trying to figure out what's special about this distribution versus that distribution, and um, and so I can uh, you know define this entropy property which over a continuous distribution, um, say this is the integral over all positions of, imagine this is a distribution of positions, and I'll use the natural logarithm for this case, but I could use um, other bases as well. 
that's supposed to be DPOS. And so this just happens to be, or otherwise known as the expected value over the distribution F of the natural log of the distribution times the position. So that's just another way to write this expected value. So, so this, uh, and then if I want to write this in a discrete case, then you say, well, if I have a discrete set of configurations, then I can say, what's the probability of, in this way, in this case, I'll put in log beta <coughs> two, just to be different for, for now. It doesn't matter too much. And um, you know, make, make it clear that it's, and so this is the probability that I'm in one of my finite number of configurations. And so this is, again, just an expectation over discrete probabilities. So discrete and continuous versions of entropy. And so somebody asked, is this the same thing as Shannon entropy? And yes, so you know, basically the, um, the, there's, there's basically the things that make this an interesting distribution physically also informationally make it interesting because it requires more information to describe these distributions than it does these distributions. And so things uh, become less compressed over time. So you start them out in an ordered state, which means they're informationally kind of poor, and then gradually, as uh, nature acts on them, as just statistics act on them, because they become more informationally rich. And so things that are spread across a lot of different possibilities, um, then I need to keep track of a lot more information. So an increase in entropy is an increase in the amount of information needed to describe the system. And there's a lot of really cool um, stuff uh, that we could get into here that we won't. Um, like one thing that's kind of fascinating is that uh, this information entropy free, ent uh, free energy connection is that whenever you build an algorithm that requires you to erase a bit, it necessarily means a certain amount of energy is released into the outside environment. <coughs> Regardless of what the wire properties are, the electrics or what, it just down to uh, as a fundamental limitation, if you write an algorithm that stores uh, you know, a, a bit, you know, x equals one, and then at some point, you basically forget that x is equal to one, and you set it hard to like x equals zero later, and that x equals zero doesn't depend on x equal one. So at the point where you set x equal to zero, you cannot get back to the point where you're at x equal one. At that instant where you have erased that information, then as a limit, uh, you, you release at least this tiny little quantity of KT log two energy into the outside world. And this becomes important uh, when you're building very high density uh, computer uh, electronics because it actually starts to become measurable. Um, it also becomes important if, uh, as, as those of you who go on and someday you start building circuits for quantum computers, it turns out that that destruction um, can actually screw up all of the things that make a quantum computer important. And so you have to rebuild your algorithms so that they do not require erasures. And so there's all this really cool stuff that we get into that we won't get into here. I just want to focus on for now so you just get the concept that there's something weird about this distribution that makes it clearer that it happens later in time. And over time, people came up with this metric on distributions, I don't want to call it a metric, this uh, measure of distributions that allows you to assign a number called entropy to a distribution. And it just so happens that over time, uh, entropy, so the, the change in entropy is guaranteed to go up over time. And so distributions of microstates evolve to higher entropy simply because there are more ways for this to go up than to go down. So basically, if you study this formula, then if you assume that uh, every microstate sort of has a uniform level of other microstates that it can access, then it turns out that the, as you evolve, from one microstate to another, it's going to be, there's a lot more ways you can get from these distributions to those distributions than back. So it's, if you focus in on a particular molecule and say it can move in any direction, 
then it is much more likely that you're gonna get another distribution of particles a little later that looks closer to that. And then if you look at that intermediate distribution, it is going to be very unlikely that the molecule is gonna put itself back where it came. So there are a bunch of ways to move out from these distributions, but only the small number of ways to move back. And because you're likely not gonna reverse the actions you've done, you're just gonna keep on moving. And so what's special about these max inter-V distributions is they basically maximize the reversibility of the distribution. Is that when you get to one of these distributions, then finally you've reached a distribution where if you move to another set of particles, uh, then you end up uh, having not really fundamentally changed the shape of where the particles are. And so here, when you move away from this distribution, you kind of move into a new family of distributions. Here, you've reached a stable distribution, where if you move away from it, you end up staying within the family. So here, these terminal distributions are the ones where, statistically speaking, it is just as easy to get to, to move out of this distribution as it is to move into this distribution, where here these are special, where there's only a very few number of ways to move back to this distribution, but there's more ways to move out of it. So that's what's special about this second law of thermodynamics, and that's what's special about these types of distributions. So that's where this, this, uh, this idea that entropy increases over time, it's just a statistical certainty that if things are jiggling around, they're going to move, and there's more. They and there's going to move in ways in which that if you, uh, no matter how, that you constrain how they move, but ultimately, as long as they have some freedom to move, then when they choose a movement, that movement will be a small set of all the things that they could have done. And in their next world, where in that that or in that next generation, then then it is very unlikely that they're going to choose a movement that will undo the movement that they just did. And so that gives you this diffusion property, and that's why you get you go from these tight to that things to totally diffused. And it's only when you hit here that finally you get a, sort of a balance between those two. Yeah. So that's the whole condensed universe thing, right? Like once we're all there, it's like it's all done. Yeah, that's the idea. Is that we're all kind of rolling downhill right now. Is that that we are sitting in, in although things look pretty uniform in terms of molecules of air in this room, the you know, our society is that in the universe. And so eventually the universe will reach that. That's sort of the idea. Yeah. Um, how do we model entropy into a problem statistic? So I understand that <coughs> entropy increases over time, but then what is the correlation in terms of modeling it into a problem? Uh, yeah, so uh, basically you can build, you can easily, uh, Sometimes I'll have simulation students do this, where like you can build a sim of just particles that, I mean, that's an easy thing to do, is you can build like an agent-based model where you initialize all your agents in one corner of a, of, a, of a space, an arena, and you can say that you, every time step, you move a small fraction in any direction. And you just do that. And if you do that over and over again, then whatever initial ordered condition you start in will end up getting obliterated. And then they, but ultimately, if you run it for long enough, it'll start looking more and more like this. And you can put additional constraints on that simulation, and you can get it to go to different distributions and equilibrium. And that's what I'm about to be talking about here. But basically, this is like, um, given that you, uh, all you know about the individual particles is some stochastic description of things that they could do, how they jiggle then if you were to simulate a bunch of this jiggling with a bunch of these particles, then how would you define the state of the whole group of them together? And that's something that's pretty easy to simulate. And mathematically, it turns out it's relatively easy to solve for these distributions, these stable distributions. And so then the, what, what, we'll end up, what we're getting at here is if we know what's special about these distributions, we're kind of saying that nature lives in a world where everything is pretty much going to be here. Like up until they push against their constraints, they'll sort of be in one of these max entropy distributions. And so these max int methods are inspired by this and then ultimately simulated annealing 
is inspired by this because it's the idea that we know that nature does interesting things in thermodynamics. We know that thermodynamically, if you put a ball on a shelf and the shelf has got a little bit of a lean to it, even if the ball looks like it's, it's sitting there over time, we can pretty much guarantee that it'll eventually come to the bottom of that, you know, if it's coming down a ramp, it'll go to the bottom of that ramp. So we know that somehow these distributions end up allowing nature to move downhill. And that is what we might want to capitalize on in simulated annealing, in which case we just need to figure out how to simulate these distributions, because these are over huge numbers of microstates, and so how do we end up sampling from that distribution, and that's what we'll get to. That's what we ultimately are getting to. But, so does this make sense, basically, this rough idea? I know this isn't a thermodynamics class, but this basic idea of, it's just statistics here, that if you start with a group of things in a clustered state, then over time they end up in this uh, getting more and more dispersed until they reach some state where if you were to, if they were to jiggle uh, around a little bit for distributionally, statistically speaking, if they were all to kind of jiggle around, they would basically just swap positions and you'd end up getting roughly the same distribution of particles. Whereas here, um, it's much more likely that they're just going to, it's going to change over and over until they finally hit this. So it's like the, the stable distribution of the family, given that they're all just jiggling. All right, so that's, yeah. Yeah, so if we had treated it as a third stage problem or something like that, which is, we started it by, uh, let's say, four uh, search agents, is, is it something to do with how we will end up with this kind of a search case? Yeah, that you could view it that way. Is that if uh, if if all of your agents, if all you know is that they search randomly, they don't search in any biased way, then if regardless of where you start them, they will come to kind of equilibrium in a dynamic equilibrium, in a dynamic sense, um, just spread throughout the space. I mean, this is why you know initially the vacuuming robots, you know, this was sort of the principle that they you know, might you know, run on is that. They might eventually follow walls or whatever, but the thought was you could kind of do a brownie and walk, and eventually you would cover the whole space. And that's kind of an important point I want to get to next here, is that um, rather than thinking of this thermodynamically, think of this thing logically. Is you're saying that given I know zero about the biases in the system, all I know is about the system's constraints. I know the system can be in a huge number of microstates, and I know um, the constraints on those microstates. And so then my question is, what is the best probabilistic distribution of microstates that reflects the fact that I know nothing else about the system? And that's what's special about this thing here. So there's a, um, a nice paper by Jarzinski, Jarzinski's inequality, where he's a, he's a, 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 a thermodynamicist, who made uh, more connections with information theory and pointed out that so much of thermodynamics shows that our physical world is being guided by information and what we know and don't know. And so um, really, you know, the fact that air particles are moving throughout this room just kind of means that there's no uniform bias in those air particles. And that, because we can't, you know, pin down that bias in each one of those particles, then they fill the room because that's, you know, informationally, that's kind of the best guess of where they're going to be, and lo and behold, they are. If you did have a bias, like gravity, then that would change things, and so that's why we have planets that form into spheres. You say, what's special about spheres? I hate, like, Michael Crichton, you know, seems to think that spheres are important, um, you know, because he wrote the book, you know, uh, in the sphere, and uh, oh, wow, the sphere is a totally, it's crazy to find a, but we see spheres all the time in nature, uh, because they're a special shape, the same way that uniformity is a special shape. You know, it, it, it shows us that given that we know that things are attracted to each other and they jiggle, that's all we know, then naturally they're going to go towards a sphere. And if you found a flat world out there, you'd say, man, uh, that flat world isn't going to be flat for very long because, uh, you know, it's, it's eventually going to ball up. And if it's not, then that indicates that we don't know something about the underlying structure that must be there. So the fact that they come to equilibrium at a state that is unexpected to us, that tells us there's information to be found. 
The fact that all of the air in this room is uniformly distributed says it's not an interesting problem for me to study the air in this room because I know everything there is to know about the air in this room and because it, it follows this distribution. So it captures the informational biases in the system. And that is the motivation behind these uh, max int methods. And the idea behind max int was really as a modeling method uh, which now is applied to data and all sorts of other things, is that you encode your information as constraints, and then you maximize entropy subject to those constraints, and then the distro you get out is the least biased distro under those constraints. So it basically is a way to encode the constraints in a distribution. So this is all the information I know. What is the best way to represent all of the information I know without accidentally adding information? That's what maximum entropy is. And so when we are making choices that require us to choose a distribution, uh, we can choose the distribution in a bunch of different ways. But when we have that freedom to choose, this suggests that there is an objective way for us to choose that distribution. And it's my claim that a bunch of things that you've seen before in other classes, they may not have been portrayed as consequences of max int, but that's, also, that's actually where the formulation came from. That is why we have these conventions. It's not because it just seemed like a good idea, somebody got it, the onzots, as the mathematicians would say, was to use this distribution, it just happened to work out. And, you know, maybe for some people that's how it worked, but there were actually good reasons for it. As an example, um, if I did want to, say, model the um, positions of particles in a box, somebody said, give me a, a, give me a plausible box. I need you to simulate a plausible box that I can use in an experiment or build me a box with stuff in it that looks like a real box that I'd see out there. And say, so what, 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 what do you know about the stuff that's in the box? And they go, well, I know that it has to fit in this box. The box is this big by this big. It's this tall. That's all. That's all that I know about the box. And so um, your constraint there, so particles in a box, if you then formulate a constraint, in this case I'll say or a line, so it's a kind of a boring box just to make this a little simpler, then my constraint is that I have a lower bound and an upper bound on where the particles can be. Now, if you, uh, you do a little um, calculus of variations with some Lagrange multipliers, and you can end up actually solving for the maximum entropy distribution subject to this constraint. I'm not gonna ask you guys to do that, but just trust me, if you're interested in it, you can look it up, how to solve for max entropy distributions. And it just is a tiny little calculus of variations plus a couple of range multipliers like you use a constrained optimization, and the maximum entropy distribution objectively, I guess, you know, like it comes right out of the math for this particular problem is that your position is distributed uniformly between the lower bound and the upper bound. So it makes sense. So this objectively pops out of the math that if all you know is there's a lower bound and an upper bound, the maximum entropy distribution is that. And that's the same reason that we kind of view that these particles that otherwise are not biased in any way are filled throughout the room. If we had a fan blowing over here, we might get particles that are clustered over there. And that would impose more information on the system, which would require me to put a different constraint in there, which would give me a different max end distribution. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just wondering how this could be applied because most real world systems are going to have so many constraints, it seems like it would be almost impossible to capture all of it. Well, so that's, and that's, I'll give a couple of these other exa examples here. So by, there's constraints, there's information, it's how much do you know? And very often you don't know a whole that lot. Much. And so that's what I'm saying is I'm saying, given that I don't know that much, how do I choose a distribution that encodes 
uh, that represents all that I know. And then the rest of the distribution is all that I don't know. I don't know where to put the particles in the box, but I know they gotta go in the box. So they're not outside the box, they gotta go inside the box. And it turns out that the least biased way to place the particles in the box is to place them uniformly throughout the box, which makes sense. So question over here. Uh, well, the panel is uh, so suppose if we have a box and we have a like a countable number of molecules, it is more likely to, uh, for their motion to form a uniform, sorry, normalized distribution curve rather than uniform distribution. I will get to the normal distribution curve because that is a maxim distribution for other constraints. Yes, actually, my question was if it is actually you are saying like when it is more uniformly distributed, so will that not be a bias? Yes, a uniform distribution is a bias. It doesn't. This uniform doesn't come out here because uniformity requires infinite support and this says finite support. And uniformity, it turns out, also requires a couple other things. So hold, let me hold on to that question. But yes, if you see uniformity coming out, then that implies that there are other informational regularities in the system that are not present in this example. Sir, no, yeah. Can we talk about constraints in this scenario? The L and U are the lower and upper bounds of what? Um, I'm saying info that I know. So this is the lower and upper bounds of where the position can be. Position. Yes. So all I'm saying is that the only thing I know, I want a distribution on X. And all I know is that X is between L and U. The maximum interview distribution uh, over all distributions, if I look at all possible ways in which I can distribute X between L and U, the one that has maximum entropy is the uniform distribution. Now. I could have asked a different problem. I could have said, I would like to um, draw not positions of particles, but space between particles. So if I want to say space between particles uh, on a line that also works on a box or in a box, then I now have a few more constraints. So for one, um, let's just say uh, for simplicity, I'm gonna draw n plus one particles. And that gives me n distances between them. And so the, um, the idea is here, I know that my constraints are, I have a distribution of distances. Well, distances cannot be negative. So all of my distances are non-negative. And I know that all of my n distances have to add up to the line length. So the sum of the distances, or I'll say i and n, all have to add up to L, and this is the line length. And uh, there's another way I could write this. I could, for kicks, um, divide both sides by 1 over n for n distances. And that would give me 1 over n, the sum of i di is equal to L over n, which is another way of saying that the average distance is L divided by n. So you could view either one of these constraints. I need to draw, uh, all I know is that a non-negative particle with a fixed average, or non-negative particles that all have to add up to a constant. And then I need to say, if that's all that I know, then what's the best, and I want to draw them randomly. Over all random distributions of distances, what is the best distribution that I should choose in order to draw them? And if I were to solve the max int problem, <coughs> then that, for these constraints, then I do not get a uniform distribution. I get an exponential distribution. So D will be exponentially distributed with mean L over N. Um, so the distribution of D is going to be L divided by N, E to the minus N over L times D. A couple of parentheses around there, I guess. Um, and so if you don't believe me, um, and I ask my undergrad SIM students to do this, uh, I think in one of my labs, um, you know, so I teach how to draw from exponential distributions in, you know, in SIM courses. Now, one way to draw an exponential is to draw a uniform random number and then take its natural log. The other way to draw and get an exponential is to draw 101 uniformly distributed random numbers, sort them, and then look at the distance between them. 
And that, all of those distances, if you take a histogram, will be exponentially distributed. So whenever you're drawing uniform random numbers and sorting them, those distances, you're actually drawing exponentials. You just didn't realize it. Because, and so there is a fundamental connection between these two. And so with that in mind, when people started modeling things like arrival rates, they had this same thing in mind. If I want to know the time between arrivals um, given an average arrival rate, so somebody comes up to you and all they say to you is, uh, I noticed today that you know, every hour from three to four people arrive roughly three people every 10 minutes. And that's all I know, is that it's on average of three people every 10 minutes. And, um, and I want to generate a simulation of that because I want to you know, do something to see if you know, that arrival rate, if I'll ever get any bursts that'll overwhelm my networks or whatever. Uh, so you could do imagine network problems there too. If all you know, and you feel pretty confident that you know the average rate, then we can implement similar constraints. And so our constraints, again, is that the time between arrivals are all non-negative, and we can say that the mean time between arrivals is um, equal to mu, which you might also write as one over lambda, where lambda is an arrival rate. And if I do, it's exactly the same problem as I just did. And so hopefully it doesn't surprise some of you, but if I take the max int of that, then I see that t is going to be exponentially distributed with mean mu. So you know the distribution t is going to be whatever the, the mean is, e to the minus 1 over mu mu times t. And, um, and so there are a number of different ways you can kind of uh, derive all the properties of the Poisson process. But what it really comes down to justifying to someone why you chose to use exponential interarrivals when you're generating your Poisson process, if you're doing a network simulation or a uh, or you know, any sort of simulation that you're doing involving arrivals, what you're actually saying is the only information that I felt that I could count on is that these non-negative arrivals had a mean arrival rate. I didn't know other variants or anything like that. All I knew is they had a mean arrival rate. And so based on that, any other choice I would make would impose additional information on the system that I couldn't justify. So this is a way of me saying that you told me that their mean arrivals were mu, their mean interarrivals were mu, and you told me that the arrivals can't be negative, they can't go back in time. Given that, then the best I can do without adding any other information to the specs that you gave me is to draw them from an exponential. So there is something informationally pure about an exponential. Now, you could say, well, you know, exponentials aren't perfect. Well, the reason they're not perfect is usually the information here is not perfect. Usually, actually, maybe this arrival rate changes over time. Maybe there are constraints on, uh, maybe actually the time is not just greater than zero. Maybe it's like in the case of a bus that you can't wait, like you actually have an upper bound on how long you can wait for a bus. And all of those additional pieces of information, if you throw into here and then do the max in, you'll get a different distribution. So the max in is a way to draw these distributions. Yeah. Um, for example, what can your exponentials? Negative one over blah? Uh, well, that's supposed to be one over mu. So I can uh, clean that up a little bit. One over mu times t. Just the standard PDF of an exponential with mu. <laughs> All right, so um, with that in mind, so somebody asked, and so the punchline's already been kind of given here. So um, there are a bunch of, well, so I could, you know, so this was in my notes here, I'm supposed to ask you this, but again, I think the cat's already been let out of the bag. Um, but we can say any guesses on whatever the max int distribution is, when someone tells you that the mean of a variable is mu and the variance of that variable is yeah. sigma squared and it's unbounded. So x we know can go from minus infinity to infinity. So that's kind of implied. So it's not really a constraint I'm just reminding. So any guesses on if I were to solve the max int problem for this, what distribution would I get at? 
a normal distribution. So there are a bunch of different ways that you've probably heard. So this here, here tells me that x should be distributed like a normal distribution with mean mu and variance uh, uh, sigma squared. And so there are probably a bunch of different ways that people can justify why you might use a normal. A lot of people might say, well, by the central limit theorem. So I've been walking back and forth. Uh, along certain paths here. I can guarantee other faculty have probably been walking back and forth down certain paths here. If we were to pull up all these carpet squares, if there was a carpet pad underneath here, there would be an average path that faculty in SIDSI and other people in this room walk around. And there would be some variance. And I can guarantee that if you took a cross section of that, that path would look like a normal distribution. And, um, and people would say, well, that's, you know, you can show that by the central limit theorem, which says that any additive process, when you're adding independent variables together, tends to um, one of these, well, tends to a normal or something that looks a lot like a normal. And, uh, and so uh, that is one way to justify it. Another way to justify it is the same way I've justified why particles are uniformly spaced throughout this room, is that I have no uh, bias. My biases are very different than Dr. Pedrielli's biases or whoever else's biases who might also be walking around here. So there's no consistent information across these except for the fact that due to the constraints of the room, we all on average walk around here. So given the only real information you know that can characterize the generic person who would stand in this position is the mean and maybe the variance, then your best guess as to where to put the wear pattern would be as a normal distribution. So this captures the fact that uh, all you know is mean and variance. So if you see a normal distribution, that probably means that there is something that is constraining these two parameters and nothing else. Yes? In your example, the normal distribution is regarding for particular particles, right? Not on the whole plane. In other words, the whole plane is not about per It's per box. Yeah, I mean, I would say that, uh, I, I would again say, if I were to slice, um, yeah. you know, through here, a line through here that I'm saying, so what's the distribution along that slice? And that's going to be a normal distribution. If I were to look at the wear pattern on that door, um, there's going to be a, a slight wear kind of in the middle of the door handle uh, that'll be more than on the edges, and that wear pattern will be a normal distribution. And it's because on average, people grab in the same spot and there's some bounds on the variance there. And so I, because I can make a guess at the mean and variance, but in nothing else, then uh, I can assume the max entropy distribution is what describes that pattern. So now I mentioned last time that computer science has made use of this in NLP. And I just wanted to show, you know, give a little more concrete details there. So you look, let's say, at a big, you know, database of text. And maybe you notice that whenever you get a certain string of words, the next word has a certain, uh, certain constraints, but, um, but those constraints don't fully constrain all of the words that could come next. And so you can add in constraints, like you might notice that there is a 40% chance of the next word being a or an. And so I could say, all right, well, I'm going to say, I don't know the probability of A or AND. But I know that the probability of A plus the probability of AND, because they're mutually exclusive, is equal to 0.4. And then I might be able to add in something like, and I know there's a 20% probability of the word the coming next. So then I might put that in as I know that the has to have a 20% probability. Uh, but I do know that there's a bunch of other words that come out of there. And maybe due to the fact that I, I just I can't really trust because they're, they're, they're so infrequent, I, I don't trust the distribution that's in the text. So I say this is the only info that I really can trust. So what is my distribution of the next words that can come? Well, I can use that discrete Shannon entropy that, you know, that um, you know, PI uh, natural or log two PI summed up over that. And I could calculate this <coughs> over all possible distributions of words that I am considering for the next word. 
and I can maximize that distribution and then draw from that distribution as my prediction of what's gonna come next. And so this was the first example um, this, these types of applications was one of the first example of people using max int in natural language processing, is that you encode the information you know as constraints, and then subject to those constraints, the same way I did these games with these continuous distributions, you then draw the discrete distribution that maximizes the entropy, and that reflects that it, you know, otherwise, whatever distribution you choose might be reflecting your internal biases as the programmer. You might say, you know, I would not normally use, um, like, I would usually use these words and that's it, you know, but you find out that other people, maybe they, they drop the article. Maybe English is not their first language and, and articles are kind of a weird thing to get used to and so on and so forth. And so I don't want to impose my biases to say the next word thus must be an article, a, and, or the, but, um, so I'm gonna allow for the possibility that it's not an article. So I look at the text and I'm pretty confident that I've accounted for say 60%, but the other 40% uh, and even the, the, the distro between A and M, I allow to float just like particles in this room float and eventually they settle out and they're spread throughout the room. And in this case, they're spread throughout the kind of corpus of words or whatever you wanna view it. And, um, and they settle out at the distribution that I choose for my next prediction of what comes next in the sentence. So that's how max int methods are applied in say natural language processing. All inspired by this idea that when you don't know information, then distributions of things you don't know spread out through the constraints that you do know. So that is sort of physics inspired. All right, so any questions about that before we get back to the physics and then to the simulated and real? Yeah. Uh, what if my uh, P across my sample is not just one? Like, for example, I, I have a good sample of it against the same line, and a bad sample of it against the same line. I try to predict my scope. So my sample may be <coughs> Well, I guess, I, I mean, th these P's that I, I'm defining here, you have to define, um, so it sounds like you're effectively defining conditional probabilities, and here you have to zoom out and, and think in terms of the universal space. And so, you, I mean, th there's, like you're looking for a distribution to find overall words. So it's relative to over all possible things that you could choose. And what we're saying here is in all, I could choose A and the or something else. And I know over the space of words that I could choose, A and the, um, ASU, school, et cetera, all of these words, um, all I know ahead of time is that uh, the probability of A and AM has to add to 40%, the probability of the has to add to 20%, and I've got 60% left over, plus the degree of freedom that I have here. And so I am going to then uniformly, well, not uniformly, I am going to maximize the entropy across the rest of this left over. So, I don't exactly, I, so I would, I would say that this, if this is done right, these probabilities all should sum to one. And that's actually one of the constraints that when you do this max int, uh, I didn't write it in, but that's another constraint that's always applied here, is these have to be distributions. Yeah. Can you give a little bit of intuition on what it means to take the logic of the probability? Well, so, I mean, the, the, where this comes from is this, idea of saying that I have um, a thousand, so what, what you're not, uh, so I guess I should technically put a negative out here, right, because the log of a number that's uh, less than one uh, is going to be a negative number and I want this thing to be positive. So this, technically all of these entropy things here, um, you know, have a negative out here. And, but if I brought the negative in, then this PI becomes a one over PI. So now, um, so this is kind of an interesting point. So if you think about this, this thing here, it now becomes PI log base two of one over PI because I just played the game of I took this negative one in, turned it into an exponent, flipped the reciprocal. So now if you really think about it, if you think of P as a frequency, 
then this is saying that um, you know if, if this is a probability of uh, 0.1, then that means that I have that could mean that I have 10 options and this is one of them. Now I've flipped it, and so this log 2 10 is effectively telling me how many bits are in the number of things that I have to choose from. So, uh, so that's kind of what uh, this is sort of telling you how many how many bits this option eats up out of all of the possible options that everything could possibly be. That's one way to view it. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, all of these these formulations here should be viewed as like if you take a you know go back to a, a, like a decent grad level textbook in probability, then you learn that any mean can take a function on the inside of it, and this is how it's implemented. You just pull the function inside the mean. So yeah, it's the mean number of bits that, uh, so the entropy of the distribution is kind of the mean number of bits you need to describe each outcome in the distribution. So that's another reason why the uniform distributions are so nice, is that everybody gets the kind of maximal number of bits. So the idea being if I have 10 options, but uh, only one of them happens, then I have 10 outcomes, but all of those outcomes are going to happen with probability of zero. But if I squeeze it all out and say that, well, okay, but all of those outcomes are equally probable, then that means that every outcome is identical. And every out so you end up kind of maximizing both of these things simultaneously. So that's why uniform distributions, if you don't have any other constraints, are the max favorite distribution. All right. All right, so if, as we have to move this back towards the simulated annealing, so we have to move it back a little bit towards the physics. And so, um, so this is the last max int example, but it justifies uh, this funny term that we end up seeing that pops up in simulated annealing. So if we go back to physics, then uh, physicists would ask, just like I asked about like what distribution best describes the distance between particles given that they have to live on a line then physicists would ask a similar question. They'd say, what's the best, uh, so what's, let's do the max int problem, but I am going to have the constraint that um, I want to know what's the distribution of energy states across particles at a uh, given and I'll say average temperature, or I'll just say given temperature. And that requires me to, in the physics case, to introduce something that you probably haven't seen for a while, but this Boltzmann con uh, con uh, constant. And so the idea is if I have a bunch of different states of a particle, the particle might jiggle a lot, it might jiggle a little bit, um, or a bunch of states of a bunch of particles, like the microstate of the world could be all of the particles, and whether some are jiggling fast and some are jiggling slow, um, this works on both of those scales. But the idea here is that the mean energy, so I use mean instead of E, because you have E for energy, so maybe I'll say mean energy um, across microstates, and so these are all of the possible configurations our system uh, is in, is equal to this Kt, where T is my temperature, and K is this so-called Boltzmann constant. And so, um, and then I also know that my energy, the state I, is greater than or equal to zero. So these are constraints for the max int problem. So you might see this term KT popping up in a bunch of different physics-y sort of things. You're like, where does this KT come up? Why KT? Because when we model these systems, we assume that they're in a box of constant temperature. And in order for us to understand how likely it is for the system to move from one state to another, we need to translate temperature into energy. And K is meant to be a conversion factor from temperature to 
So this KT, whenever you see KT, where you're actually, somebody is communicating to you what the mean energy is in the room, or the mean energy is in the configuration. And so all, across all configurations, they have to have this mean energy. Some are gonna have slightly more energy, some are gonna have slightly less, some particles are moving slow, some particles are moving fast, but overall, if you look at all the jiggling in the room, then those, uh, then the, the amount of energy you have on average across them will be KT. If I heat up the room, they all jiggle a little bit more, so they all get more energy. So it's a way to convert from temperature to energy. So that uh, you know, shows up, and this T is going to be important when we get into the simulated annealing stuff. And so it might not be surprising then that the maximum entropy distribution of this looks like an exponential. So the so-called Boltzmann-Gibb distribution of energy across microstates in this configuration is an exponential for the same reason that the other two exponentials came up. It's the same constraints. So you've got the, uh, you're basically an average across energy states, and the energy states have to be greater than or equal to zero. And so the probability that you are in, and I'll do uh, discrete states here, any particular microstate is just equal to the energy of that microstate, well, the exponential, e to the minus, e to the i over kt, the energy of that microstate, divided by the average energy sort of available in the room. So this kind of tells you that if you're eating up all of the energy, you're, it's, uh, then this is, you know, this is gonna be e to the minus one, and if you have like none of the energy, this will be e to the zero. And, um, and then that's over this normalizing factor in the, in the denominator here, which is called, the, sometimes it's called Q or Z, and it's the partition function. And it turns out that most of the time we don't need this thing because we're often comparing ratios of states and it all cancels out. And so the, what we'll end up seeing showing up in simulated annealing is this so-called likelihood ratio And the idea being that we're going to see that it's if you're in a particular state i, you want to know um, how likely is it that you are going to move to a state of higher or lower energy. And so uh, we can say, well, what's the likelihood ratio of state j, the state you're moving to, given that you came from state i? And that's just going to be the ratio of these two things. So this ugly partition function cancels out. And then you just have an exponential divided by another exponential. And so that just becomes this e to the minus delta ji divided by kt, where delta ji is just the energy difference from e to the j. And I'll put a little defined in there. So that's um, e to the j minus e to the i. And so this here, this likelihood ratio, um, so just like any other likelihood, you can kind of say that like, given that I know that I am at this particular temperature, then this is going to give me a way to decide whether it is favorable for me to move from this state to another state. And that is what's going to move us around in our simulated annealing, or in our metropolis algorithm. And if you are to uh, move your microstates in your simulated world around, and you don't change the temperature, then your microstates will settle out along the Boltzmann distribution. So this is a way of effectively sampling microstates whose energy falls along an exponential. And we'll see what I mean by that. All right, so, um, so we've got this thing here, so now, uh, the, the first step to getting to the, to the simulated annealing is to just simulating at a constant temperature. And so this is what Metropolis came up with his algorithm that was later generally generalized by Hastings. And this is the first uh, Markov chain uh, Monte Carlo algorithm. And so um, this is, I'm going to generate an arbitrary multivariate, I'll call it X0, um, and 
some proposal density which uh, generally could might be called uh, G where G is a is a PDF of Y given X and this is my previous X you can think of this as my next uh, X and usually it's taken to be something like X plus zero mean Gaussian uh, randomness. So I generate some arbitrary starting position and effectively I generate a, a, a proposed next position. So then I, you know, that's what I generate. Next candidate by sampling from this G distribution up here. And then now I just need to decide whether I want to stay where I am or take the new one. And that's where this likelihood ratio comes into play. And so I calculate an acceptance ratio and that's where um, in the Metropolis algorithm it was um, the expectation, it was just the, that, that formula that I had on the previous case here. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to call the acceptance ratio here F of Y over F of X, which is equal to, in the original Metropolis algorithm, X to the, to the delta JI over KT. So this is the, but what Hastings did is he realized that this is what you want to do if you want to sample from the Boltzmann distribution. But if you want to sample from any other distribution, you put that distribution's PDF in here. And so that's what this is sort of saying, is that how are you on the, the PDF you want is given your new position relative to your old position, which is your acceptance ratio. And then if it's greater than one, that's right, then you can um, accept Y and keep going. And then uh, otherwise, um, keep X and uh, try a new candidate. And then so both of those end up then taking you back to, to two afterwards. And this is the first uh, MCMC or um, Markov chain, I could say, yeah, um, Markov chain Monte Carlo. MCMC. And these are a class of algorithms that generate samples from distributions in a sequential way. So rather than in a one shot saying, I'm going to take a uniform random number, run it through a transformation, and give you a sample, and then I'm going to do another uniform random number, and so on and so forth, those old fashioned ways, that guarantees independence across your samples. Here, what we're saying is we're going to generate a sample, and then our next sample will be based on our previous sample. And that's what gives us the Markov chain part of it. But we are, are going to be interested in all of the samples that come out of it, and that's where the Monte Carlo comes out of it. So the downside of these methods is you potentially generate samples which, uh, do, which have autocorrelation. They are correlated with previous samples. And so you, all of the, in the kind of class of MCMCs, there are a bunch of methods that kind of reform this a bit to help guarantee that when you get, you know, get one sample, the next sample won't be super predictable from the previous sample. And it could be something as simple as I get a sample and then I take 10 more and discard them, and then my next sample is the one I keep. That would be, you know, one simple way, but that's very costly. So are there other ways to do it? So there are other MCMCs, but this was the first MCMC. And so it's, uh, it's pretty clever and it's pretty cheap to do as long as you're, you can you know, go long enough to get enough uh, samples. It takes a while to settle out. So maybe the initial samples won't be according to your desired distribution, but eventually you'll end up coming to equilibrium at the max entropy distribution, which you've effectively imposed on the system by your choice of F. 
So you are sort of forcing this to be the max entropy, max entropy distribution for this simulated system that you've put into the world. So that's the Metropolis uh, algorithm. And so this, uh, like I said, is one of the first MCMCs. So are any questions about that? This is a good time to pause in case people need a pause. Yeah. Uh, when do we stop? When, uh, here, you run as long until you, so that's the idea of these Monte Carlos, is that you want 100 samples, you run this 100 times, maybe 150 times, because you need 50 times to kind of get rid of the transients. Um, you want 1,000 samples, you run this 1,000 times. So this is not an optimization algorithm. This is a sampling algorithm. Yeah. You said it makes this to the um, max entropy distribution. Mm. I was trying to like how the metropolis takes the algorithm. It's kind of like a function where you can just kind of push in the distribution that you want, right. and it gives you the transitions you want to your Mars not change, right. or change things. But uh, like like say I want this. Um, I mean, often you want like the big triple distribution, mm -hmm. but maybe you want another distribution. Mm -hmm. Well, what I meant by that is conceptually, so the way max int works is I push constraints in and I solve for the max int. Uh, here, I don't have constraints. This is sort of, um, what this is saying is this generates a quasi-physical process that mixes, that comes to equilibrium at a desired distribution. So it's not maximal entropy in any way that I can specify a priori but I've now generated a process that just like air particles in this room, ends up mixing to a distribution I want. So it was a little much for me to say this is max in. Uh, you say, well, it's max in subject to what? Well, maybe I can dream up conditions that come. So this somehow manages to constrain the motion of these particles so that they converge to this distribution. That's all I'm saying. Any other questions about Metropolis Hastings or this MH? see if I want to go any farther. So basically, all we have left here is we take this algorithm, and so what Kirkpatrick did in 1983 is that, um, is that he basically said, uh, well, let's stick with um, something related to the original Metropolis algorithm, which represents this kind of energy landscape. So he uh, Kirkpatrick et al. recognized that he wanted something energy-like, but he wanted to impose um, the, something that so that lower energy states meant you were going lower on an optimization function. So basically what we're going to do is make a minor modification to Metropolis Hastings that allows it to crawl down over time. It's constantly jiggling and then gradually getting over local optima, little barriers, so that it can crawl downhill and find a minimum of some function. And, um, and then you kind of don't want it to keep jiggling. Like, you want this MCMC. Here, you want the MCMC to go wherever the distribution takes it, and it just be all over the place. So in simulated annealing, you're going to take this temperature parameter, and you're going to gradually cool it down so that each one of these little moves takes, uh, it's harder and harder to get over these little barriers. And that's what simulated annealing does. It starts at first allowing you to get over every barrier and gradually cools things down so you can't get over any and you get stuck, hopefully, in the lowest little pit of this potential well. So next time, we'll just pick up from there and, um, and then talk about what modifications we make to this to turn it into simulated annealing. Okay, so that's all I've got for you today. Thank you.